good morning to uh, Dr. Chen, and also my colleagues. So today, me and uh, Abi will present on child with breathlessness as well as child with sinus. So I'll start first. So for the child with breathlessness, so for the definition, uh, breathlessness, or we can also say a shortness of breath or dyspnea is basically uh, increase for a breathing or the alteration of the pattern of the breathing which is mentioned in some flower and in up to date we mentioned that Krishna is a subject subjective experience for breathing discomfort uh, and it is a qualitative in nature basically is variable from person to person and also in Nelson we mentioned that Krishna is also considered as one of the symptoms of respiratory distress. So we can also mention that Krishna is the uh, respiratory distress. Okay, so for the causes of breathlessness or respiratory distress, uh, I divided into age, anatomy, and uh, yeah. So for the age related causes of respiratory distress, uh, can be divided to food pneumonia, infant toddler, children, and also adolescent. So we focus on the common causes. There are a lot of them, but right? um, for the food and units, the most common is meconium aspiration pneumonia. And for the for the for the infant and toddler, the topmost is the viral pneumonia, bacterial pneumonia, and also aspiration. And for older children, pneumonia and asthma is uh, are the common causes of aspiration. The same goes with the adolescent. Mm. And this, mm. yes. so this is the causes in terms of anatomy. Uh, it can be divided into extra as well as I'm sorry, Anish. Yes, sorry, that day. Uh, can you adjust your mic? I think I heard some noises. Oh, okay, it's better now. Okay. Yeah. Uh, other noise. Other noise. Okay. Other background noise. Yeah, other background noise. Mike. My my earphone is other mic, so I don't know where. Got any problem? So I know it's up. Better now? Anish just kata cuba tak guna earphone. Oh, macam okay. Uh, dengar ke? Dengar ke? Uh, dengar tapi tak boleh kot. Sebab speaker dia tak. Ni? Dia tak. Ni? Speaker laptop ni pecah so kalau tak pakai dia pun dia tak dengar sangat. Kalau tak apa-apa just uh, uh, just stop ni lah kalau tak dengar. So for the causes of respiratory distress can be divided into intrathoracic and also extrathoracic. So for the intrathoracic can further divided into pulmonary and also cardiac. And um, so for the pulmonary, uh, as what you mentioned in up to date, you mentioned that for uh, pulmonary, it, it depends on these three things. First is the ventilation. Second is the percussion and third is a uh, gas exchange. So any alteration to these three things, it can cause a respiratory distress to the patient. So uh, for example, for the ventilation, there will be disruption in the uh, passage of the uh, airway. For example, in uh, foreign body aspiration, so there will be impaired ventilation and it can cause respiratory distress to the patient. Or for example, uh, in um, patient with poor infusion, so there will be uh, um, so there will be disruption to the uh, gas exchange. So it also can cause um, respiratory distress to the patient. Same goes with pulmonary embolism. It will affect the perfusion towards uh, the 
uh, the airway, so this also can cause the cell to lose hair. So uh, there is a lot in this, and for the cardiac, uh, there is myocarditis or cardiomyopathy, and also um, congenital heart disease and congestive heart failure also can cause the cell to lose hair. Um, for the nervous system, for example, meningitis or any shock or sepsis to the patient can also cause respiratory distress or breathlessness or metabolic causes, for example, acidosis or acute acidosis in diabetic or in type 1 diabetic patient. Mm. So, a uh, lesion of upper airway, for example, there is formation of cysts or wet that uh, prevent the air from uh, circulating well or for the miscellaneous, for example, abdominal masses or anemia. Mm. So this is another uh, classification, the non-pulmonary causes. So this is in Nelson. We also mentioned about the mechanism. Uh, for example, for the cardiovascular system, um, example is left to right shine or congestive heart failure or cardiac shock. So the mechanism mentioned is that when there is left to right shine, there will be increase in the pulmonary, there will be pulmonary congestion. So uh, later it can lead to pulmonary hypertension, which can cause the patient to be breathless. Or for example, metabolic acidosis, for example, in progressive heart failure. Uh, later it can cause um, uh, skin injury, which later can also lead to metabolic acidosis. So when there is metabolic acidosis, the receptors, uh, the peripherals, also the ventricular receptors, will detect there will be high, uh, there will be low pH or high carbonic acid. So it can cause, can stimulate the respiratory center um, for the patient to increase in the so that the patient can uh, excrete more carbon dioxide. Mm. So for the bioreceptive stimulation, from what I understand, for example, in cardiac shock, there will be low in blood pressure. So when there is low in blood pressure, the bioreceptor reflex will be diminished. So when the, this reflex is diminished, uh, the higher center, we stimulate the sympathetic activity uh, to increase the cardiac cardiac port and as well as uh, stimulate the adrenal gland to produce more epinephrine and also norepinephrine. So the patient, uh, uh, so the outcome will be uh, when there is increase in cardiac port, there will be increase in uh, blood pressure as well as when there is uh, increase in sympathetic activity, the patient also can be better. Okay. So for the central nervous system, when there is alteration to the brainstem, you also can, uh, because brainstem is the one that controls the respiration. So when there is, uh, there is a pathology to the area, you also can cause the patient to have respiratory distress. And same goes with the metabolic causes because of the acidosis to stimulate the tumor receptors later on and cause the patient to be breathless. Okay. For the history, uh, when when you approach a patient that have a complaint of breathlessness, so how do you approach this kind of patient? First, uh, we detect to the onset, the duration of the chronicity, we can differentiate, we can ask, uh, is it abrupt or gradual? So if, if it is abrupt or sudden, it's suggestive more towards upper airway condition. For example, from foreign body aspiration or the patient had uh, anaphylactic reaction, uh, previously had underlying allergy, or the patient had a uh, sudden uh, spontaneous thorax or pure effusion or a uh, pulmonary embolism. And for the gradual onset, it's more towards uh, something that is insidious or, for example, infection, anemic uh, condition or patient in failure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also we need to ask whether is this the first uh, episode or it already has the recurrent, which suggests more of quantity. Okay, so for aggravating factors, uh, we can also ask about exposure to house dust mite or cigarette smoking, uh, which can precipitate um, patients that have asthma to have breathlessness. Or this near on exertion, which also suggestive of asthma, or any history of playing unsupervised. unsupervised. Or top, I have 
Specificity of protein is is suggestive of patient to have a poor body experience so when they are playing and sacrifice for we uh, take something without we know. And the relieving factors, um, for example, uh, does the patient uh, the best resistance does it respond to any therapy or the reason does it respond to any therapy? For example, in asthma, uh, they may respond post post having the bronchodilator. But in patient that using the two point body aspiration, even though they uh, took bronchodilator, for example, the symptom remains still persist because there is still the pathology there. Okay. And also, um, in the book mentioned that in certain patients, they will sit in this position, the sniffing position, which is to maximize the airway frequency. And this is really happen if there is after airway attraction. So, later in the physical examination, I will show to you what is sniffing position. Okay. So, um, for the associated symptoms, um, you can also ask about the respiratory symptoms. So if, if there is any code symptom, for example, sore throat or runny nose, which can indicate some respiratory infection. Or does the patient have a characteristic to a cough, for example, bucky cough, barking cough, which can suggest code. Uh, if there is a, you can also ask the patient if there is any, does the mother notice any retraction, muscle retraction? Especially over the supracurricular and supraspinal, which uh, suggestive of upper and mean. So, usually the intercostal and the lower down is more to uh, lower uh, lower airway, but for supracurricular and supraspinal, can be suggestive of upper and retraction. So, with regards to Kylie, you can also ask uh, the mother uh, that she notice any looking at pale or blue discoloration. So, if pale, it may indicate anemia or uh, if blue discoloration, it can indicate uh, there is uh, probably reducing, there, there is a uh, high deoxygenated blood, for example, in ponytail heart disease. Um, we also can ask about respiratory effort if the mother look at the um, the children, if there is poor effort, so it could be muscular dystrophy. Or we can ask about the change in the voice. Is it muffled or hoarse voice? Because uh, if there is changes to the voice, usually it is suggestive of upper airway affection. Because lower area usually they typically don't have any changes to the voice. The character of the voice. Okay. So for the systemic symptoms, uh, we can ask about fever which can indicate infective causes. Or we, can, we can also ask about hydration status, the intake and the output. Um, because shock can also be one of the uh, one of the causes of breathlessness or if the patient is having severe breathlessness, it can also inside the hydration status of the patient. And then uh, we, can, we also need to ask about the weight loss or if there is any failure to gain weight for during the development to be developed because this can indicate in the inborn area metabolism or in a chronic condition, for example, like congestive heart failure, they can impair the group. So for abdominal pain, uh, you can ask about abdominal pain. Um, abdominal pain may indicate either it's abdominal pathology, for example, there is obstruction or infection going on that uh, cause the patient to be breathless, or it is actually a refractory. The patient had a low bar pneumonia, which is basically pneumonia, which, which irritates the diaphragm that can cause refractory pain to the abdominal area. Or the patient actually had a metabolic abnormality, for example, that is cirrhosis, which also can uh, have abdominal pain and also can have breathlessness. For chest pain, in the indicate underneath continuous thorax or there is private symptom. So that is symptom wise, and this is a good based on the disease. Uh, just so, so, as you see, uh, you can also ask about. Uh, the exposure or 
environmental factors, for example, exposure to fire. When there is fire, the breathlessness can be due to the direct injury, due to the thermal injury to the airway, or because of the byproduct of the fire itself, which is carbon monoxide and also cyanide. So, the, as you know, the carbon monoxide has a um, higher, uh, higher affinity uh, compared to the uh, high affinity simulator. Uh, our body, the oxygen, um, cannot be reduced to the tissue, so it can cause also blood pressure. So it goes with sign up. Mm. And then that is about fire, and you, can, you also need to ask the patient if there is any exposure uh, to allergen or any history of allergy, which, um, and the patient also can manifest with anaphylaxis, uh, anaphylaxis for example, like. Uh, uh, swelling of the mouth or any interior or the rash, the interior rash, the, the one that is uh, the wing, the anaphylaxis. Okay. And then uh, another exposure could be exposure to smoke. For example, it's asthma patient, the family member or the family member, the uh, member uh, smoking it can also trigger the patient to have a and for the trauma, uh, because trauma can also uh, lead to breathlessness. For example, pneumothorax, stage child, cardiac peponic, and also abdominal injury. Or if there's any uh, trauma to the head, it also can cause, a, it also can affect the respiratory system and cause the patient to be breathless. So of course, in a pediatric patient, we also need to exclude the non accidental injury. Yeah. And the last order intake, uh, in, in the book, we mentioned that we need to also ask about uh, last order intake because we might think of it of only as we will see. So, as you see, for the past meeting, uh, we need to ask if uh, there is any previous episode, similar episode, and if there is any treatment to treat the episode previously. So, maybe uh, if uh, the medication, uh, the previous episode, it responds to the same medication, then probably this episode, it can also be the same medication. Or, uh, you can also ask for uh, specific chronic medication, for example, if the patient has underlying uh, hematology disease, for example, sickle cell disease, could be the patient that really has been the acute syndrome. Or if the patient had underlying chronic asthma or uh, nephrotic syndrome, the uh, patient can come with a food or blood and become breathless. Or if there is any recurring chest infection. And we can also ask about history of uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease because this can uh, this is the patient who is having aspiration pneumonia. And also previous intubation. Um, for the previous intubation, which can be the patient who has uh, current pneumonia, for example, in, if that in the first history, if the patient uh, is premature or has history of intubation, which can be the patient who has been going to the PD, going to the patient, um, but it also can come with the current infection and the patient. For the birth history, uh, immaturity, which can lead to congenital anomalies, for example, of the lung and heart, for example, Down syndrome. And if the mother having gestational diabetes mellitus, because it can be pretty satisfactory for the uh, baby who has um, a little heart disease. Okay. So for the immunology history, is important. Especially for the hemophilus influenza vaccine, HIV vaccine, which uh, for the patient that don't take this vaccine, they have high risk of developing uh, activities. And if the patient um, had history of um, non compliance to immunization, for example, for BCD, the patient will uh, be discharged towards from me to the blood. It's 
support family history and ask about the history of asthma, history of allergy or FFP. If there is any preventer heart disease in the family or uh, cardiovascular disease in the family or any syndrome that uh, inherited in the family. Or if there is any history of diabetes in the family as well. Okay, so for the social history, you need to ask about the environmental factors, right? the housing area, the house, and how about their performance, how they are especially if it's chronic, how it affects their school performance and how do they uh, have this for activities. Does it interfere with their life or not? And if there is any travel speed, which can, suggest, can be suggestive of uh, risk of infection. So for the physical examination, um, generally you can look for uh, whether the patient is alert or conscious or not. Uh, in the book, you mentioned that if the patient is agitated or somnolent, it's more like bowing, it may indicate that the patient is actually having severe respiratory distress and impending respiratory failure. So we need to uh, be aware of the consciousness of the patient. If the patient is looking suggestive of um, infection, for example, in epilotitis, usually the patient is very sexy looking. Mm, very looking. And for this, uh, this is the specific posture. As the patient is in sniffing posture, which I will uh, show you later. And does the patient have a morphology feature suggestive of uh, having a Down syndrome or tennis syndrome? You can also look for the uh, degree of sinusitis as well as the nutrition status of the patient. Because in, uh, for example, in the uh, heart failure or chronic asthma, uh, the patient can have a uh, retarded okay. So this is the sneezing position. Um, so if, uh, usually when the patient had upper airway expression, they will be in this uh, sniffing position because it basically kind of like align the airway to, to make the uh, airway in a straight line so that the breathing is affected. So the sniffing position is either you put a tower at the shoulder, upper shoulder or below the occiput. And then the glabella and the chin, as you can see in the picture, you need to be horizontally aligned. And the neck is wide and open adequately, not too high to extend it or uh, too flat. And the external odometers is in line with the supercellular. So this is the sniffing position. Because uh, in, uh, um, in children, their occiput is uh, bigger. So, uh, when they are in supine position, they tend to be in a uh, hyper extended, hyper extended position. The opposite tends to be lower down. So, you, so the neck will be hyper extended. And um, as you can see in the picture, can you see my person? Can you see my person? Yes, I need. Thank you. So, for example, in this position, the patient is a uh, hyper extended position. This is hyper extended. So, when there is hyper extended of the neck, then the airway will not be in a completely straight line. So, it will be, uh, make it harder for them to be. So, if in the sneaking position, the airway is in is aligned better, so it can help with the respiration. But then, if the head is too flat, it also can obstruct the airflow. So, so that's why the sleeping position is uh, better. Mm -hmm. So, as we mentioned before, in the general examination, we need to look for the any uh, morphology features, the suggestive of syndrome, for example. Uh, in Down syndrome, we can have this uh, typical facing with uh, the African people in a slanted upper tissue. The slanted upper tissue means that the uh, the nasal tissue is lower compared to the temporal tissue. 
and there is also in the eyes you can see there is a brush report and for the limbs the there is single palmar piece and the uh, the fifth digit is usually um can you see the quite it's not straight lah it's a bit uh a bit not flat but i don't remember the term there is a apology lah to the digit the the single digit okay and there is a white center gap uh, between the first toe and the second toe okay so that is for down syndrome for tennis syndrome usually they are short stitches and have a wet neck speed a uh, wet neck the neck appears uh, larger and for example the nipple is widely split and also there is also other features of the nipple so there is uh it's a for the next general inspection we also need to is uh to add the respiratory pattern. So there are a few respiratory patterns. First is rapid and shallow breathing with prolonged exhalation. When there is prolonged exhalation means there is an air trapping. For example, in asthma or for body exhalation. So when there is a uh, pathology there, so the during exhalation, it takes more time compared to normal to properly exhale. Um, so that's why there will be prolonged exhalation. Okay. Or the patient is in uh, in pain, so also the reason for the solution. And the second is to small respiration, uh, deep, regular labor breathing. This indicates uh, metabolic acidosis. Or the change to respiration is more towards uh, CNS pathology. For example, CNS immaturity in premature baby, the high center is still not fully developed. Or if there is inadequate cerebral perfusion or brain injury or increase in structural inflammation, all of this condition can uh, present with change to respiration. And the last one is paradoxical breathing. This is uh, this suggestive of paradoxical breathing, meaning the during inspiration, the 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 chest is uh, lowered down and the abdomen is rise up. So uh, should be both. Uh, should be uh, should, should be is the other way around. So this indicates respiratory fatigue or muscle illness. Okay, so this is the signs of respiratory distress. There are disappearing sinuses, grunting, head bobbing. So for head bobbing is the extension of the head and also the neck during inhalation. And during expiration, the head and neck will fall forward again. This indicates that the patient is having, and the patient is very fatigued because of respiratory distress, and this is actually a poor, a poor feature of respiratory distress. When it's already severe respiratory distress, the patient will present to the table and the jumping. Other signs of respiratory distress is a retraction of muscle, for example, the supraspinal and the postal and subcostal muscle. Which indicates worsening and respiratory distress. And the last one is cardio and also Um, that's for general examination for the vital signs. Uh, for the respiratory, rate, if the patient is epidemic, it may indicate patient having respiratory duties or because of fever or because of the patient is crying or as also other causes, for example, cardiac disease and metabolic acidosis. If the patient had apnea or bradypnea, it can be due to respiratory muscle fatigue. Or in premature neonates, it is because of the higher center is still immature, so they can have sudden apnea. And in young patients, um, apnea or bradypnea usually can be due to infection, for example, bronchitis. Or in young uh, or in older children, uh, it can be due to choking, head trauma, or poisoning. So for the heart rate, cardiac, can be because of respiratory distress or the patient is also in dehydration. Or body cardiac, which is usually a late sign and it can later progress into cardiac arrest. This is the uh, respiratory rate based on age, which can be in the protocol. So 
uh, for artificial commentary measurement, as I mentioned before, um, we need to chart the weight, the height, and if there is any stunted growth, it can be in the of severe asthma or heart disease. Okay, so for the respective examination on inspection, you can look at the size, at the shape of the chest, can be practice excavation or practice animation, or it could be a direct chest which suggests if of patient had hyperinflation, for example, in asthma. Or we can also look for a uh, Harrison Sultis, Harrison Sultis, um, which indicates in chronic asthma because there is a chronic, uh, because when the chest is always hyperinflated and the diaphragm keeps on contracting, so later it can cause this Harrison Sultis. So that's for uh, inspection for palpation. Also for palpation. Um, uh, if there's any tracheal deviation or um, uh, displaced effects, it can indicate that there is a medicine shift, for example, in the ventral motor. Or you can also palpate for subcutaneous emphysema, uh, which can indicate there is a family edit. So for percussion, dullness indicates um, consolidation or epilepsy or probably there is pain diffusion. So usually pain diffusion will uh, begin to respond in dullness. And if there is hyperresonance, there could be hyperinflation. And so for auscultation, um, these are two uh, added sounds that we can uh, during the long examination. Uh, so we see it's a continuous high pitch and musical, usually indicative of uh, lower area in fraction, for example, in asthma. Or if the patient when it's auscultic, there is a prolonged expiratory phase, it may indicate that there is a fractal lower area. Or stridor, um, usually more towards uh, after area of fraction. So, practice of certification, um, usually it is during inspiratory and it occurs because of the opening of the airway or the alveoli, which is previously already closed during the expiration. And long cry is a continuous sound, more or less like using is just that it is more lower pitch and it also indicates a lower, lower airway. So apart from respiratory examination, uh, to exclude other causes from other systems. So for example, for CNS, if there's any alternative status, it can also be due to the infection or any head trauma, any toxic ingestion or hyperammonia because of uh, when there is high amount of ammonia, it can cause insecurity. It can affect an status or infiltration that's needed. So for the cardiovascular examination, um, murmur, jugular visitation, cardiology and hypotonogy, all of this may indicate the patient who is in the area. It can also prevent the symptoms. For the CGI screen, if there is any abdominal tenderness or abdominal distension, and for endocrine, the loss, dehydration, and fatigue and abdominal pain may indicate uh, uh, the difficult to express it. So for the next one is allergy. The patient may have leukemia and also facial swelling and also oral pain the edema. Which the patient can be given to eat the person. So for the investigation, uh, for the vaccine, you can do pass as an EP to look at the oxygen level. And for the lab investigation, you can do venous or actual blood gases to look for the oxygen or the or if there's any presence of metabolic acidosis. And other lab investigation is uh, depends on the on each differential diagnosis that we want to work out. Okay. Okay. Uh, so for the imaging, sorry. So for the imaging, uh, we do chest x-ray and from the chest x-ray, we 
can, uh, you can look for any lung abnormalities. If there is any consolidation or information, or we can also look for any area of suction if it is ready of food. Okay. And uh, for bony thorax, the bit it is uh, probably because uh, in trauma patient there will be a test or we can see a broken segment of the bit or the vegetable abnormality probably because of polyosis. We can also infer the thoracic cavity. Also, patient can be very breathlessness. And um, from the chest x ray itself, we can also look for cardiomegaly, chromium edema, and also pericardial effusion, which may be suggestive of heart failure. And also, we can look for the blood vessel. So, for the ultrasound, um, for the pulmonary ultrasound, we can see any features of pneumothorax or pericardial effusion or other free information, for example, black hematorrhage or family edema. Echocardiogram is to assess if there is infrared component for any structural abnormality or functional abnormality of the heart. And for the CT scan, uh, you can look for uh, any, uh, any medicinal abnormalities or medicinal lesions or if there is any bronchiectasis, which can also be so breathlessness. And for MRI, you can uh, search for the vessel anatomy. If there is any alteration to the uh, vessel, for example, into the heart, uh, in the heart disease, and so on. Yeah. And also in the book, mentioned about the endoscopic evaluation of airways. There are two, this is nasopharyngoscope. Uh, and also bronchoscopy. So for the nasal pharyngoscope, it is to assess the adenoid size, the nasal passage frequency, and also if there is any uh, elementary geography. Also, it can evaluate if there is any stridor and assess the vocal cord. So maybe there is any upper area of traction, so we can use nasal pharyngoscopy. And for bronchoscopy, um, there are two types, flexible and solidity. It can be used to identify area anomalies, or at the same time, it can also uh, uh, take the sample for control. And for the rigid bronchoscopy, it can be used to remove the foreign body as well. So, for the principle of measurement, uh, basically, um, in general, we need to stabilize the patient first for the, uh, according to the ABC. So, for the airway, we need to ensure a patient airway. So, if the patient is unresponsive, we need to do the drug test or the chin uh, maneuver. And when we already uh, establish uh, this position, we need to clear the airway by doing suction. And um, if still this position doesn't really be obstruction, then we need to opt for exam. For example, the orofringe airway or the nephrosophringe airway. For the breathing, as we already include a patient area, then we need to provide necessary oxygen support if the uh, patient needs the oxygen. We need to monitor the oxygenation by pulse uh, oximetry. The last one is circulation. We need to monitor the heart rate and also the rhythm and establish vascular access for pre administration or medication for the So, this is the picture. The left one is the oropharynge uh, airway and the right one is the nasopharynge so the difference is that the nasopharynge nasopharyng is um it is uh, flexible compared to the the oropharynx the oropharynge it, it is um is better for patient that is um, unresponsive or unconscious because it can cause um, get reflex and also uncomfort to the patient because it causes the soft okay. Okay. So that is the general approach of the uh, general assessment. And, and now I'm going to discuss about asthma and also pneumonia, but then uh, I only highlight the important points. So for asthma, 
it is a collateral information that leads to increasing in your consciousness. So how do we diagnose asthma in the documentation? It's based on the history and also the presence of airway reversibility after uh, administering a bronchodilator. But then this is this is for uh, older children. In younger children, uh, based on history, this presentation and also can be used so for asthma. Mm, as I mentioned before, so the history is based on this Mia using the slightly so And we also need to ask about the pattern of the symptom. It is episodic and really asthma is episodic. And there is a, a, there is a free period from the information. And then, uh, the, is it diurnal or does the symptom uh, as a duration after or during the before the precipitation factors, usually asthma is precipitated by common cold or allergen, or if there is any cold weather or irritants, for example, smoke taste, strong smells, or exhaust pain. So, according to the CDC protocol, um, um, the, the, there is a guideline or suggestion in the history what should we ask. So, we need to ask about. Um, Previous of the emission and what treatment is described before, and how is the response of the patient to the treatment, and if there is any history of exacerbation or history of epilepsy. And for the family history, we need to ask the family history of epilepsy, like I mentioned before. And for the social history, we need to ask about the environment and the impact of the asthma to respond the life of the patient. So for the physical examination, for chronic illness, we believe you can. Uh, if there is crazy outside, happy in the chest, uh, on the skin that they have eczema or dry skin, and on the nose there is hypertrophic edema. And for acute exacerbation, basically the respiratory distress symptoms of the sinusitis, the tricardia and the and other. So, um, in younger patients, there is also features that are suggestive of asthma. For example, cough, there is associated with this and also darkness. And the cough is usually in the absence of infection. Usually the cough is associated with laughing, crying, or any exposure to the smoke when the patient or the children can have cough. And the children also can have recurring uh, wheezing, either during sleep or um, associated with triggers, for example, when they are uh, doing activities, playing around, or laughing with their friends, or laughing with their family, laughing with their family, or crying, or if there's any exposure to the smoke. They also can have shortness of breath while doing the daily activity, and also reduce in activity. So they tend to not to run, not to play with other children because they have this preference. And also there is a positive tendency of uh, LAD disease or FOP. So this can be suggestive of the patient may have asthma. So in patient that is less than five years old, um, uh, we use this approach which is uh, the probability of asthma in the patient. So uh, based on this characteristic, the duration of symptoms, the number of exacerbation, the interval symptoms, and also the tendency of FOP. Based on this characteristic, you will divide them into whether they are higher probability of asthma, uh, moderate or low. So, um, if the children, for example, have higher probability of getting asthma, then probably the doctor will start the patient on trial of cortisolate uh, ICS. So for moderate, probably the doctor will uh, wait first before starting the medication. And for the patient with low risk, the doctor needs to roll out uh, other diagnosis uh, compared to asthma. So in um, so in older children, uh, six years and older, if they are newly diagnosed with asthma, then we need to categorize them into the severity of the asthma, whether it is intermittent or persistent. Persistent, there is mild, moderate, and so severe. So, 
uh, when we already um, specify them going to the severity of the asthma, then we can start them on the medication based on the severity. And during follow up, um, and during follow up, uh, we need to assess the asthma control, the compliance, and also um, educate them about asthma. So for the asthma control, sorry. So for the asthma control, so severity is medication is needed to the asthma. And during follow up, we need to assess their level of control because uh, depending on this level of control, then we will step up or step step down the uh, current treatment. So the level of control is based on the big um, asthma symptom, any not any symptoms, any visible needed or any activity needed can be the asthma. So based on the symptom, based on the control, so if the patient already complying to the medication and using the right technique, but still the uh, asthma symptom is not controlled, then we need to step up the coding to this uh, So for the asthma, uh, the asthma education, we need to make them understand about the asthma injected, and we emphasize them on the compliance of therapy, and also give them the written asthma action plan. So this is the written asthma action plan. Uh, it is basically um, for the doctor to give them, um, uh, for them to know uh, what is the current status of the asthma, and what they need to do if there is a uh, worsening symptoms. So what they need to do and what they need to take and when they should uh, go to the uh, uh, or to the hospital uh, based on this different asthma plan. So basically, the doctor wants to plan to the patient to make a small adjustment to their current treatment according to their current status based on the symptoms as well as the PFR. Um, yes, uh, so that is for patients with chronic asthma. For patients with acute asthma, uh, during the acute attack, you need to specify them if you might move in severe or less threatening based on three parameters, based on the symptoms, signs, and also uh, investigation. So symptoms is uh, based on their breathlessness and their ability the input on things or play or educate or the are they drowsy uh are they are the technique for very uh very poor practice effort or if there is any other distracted distress time for example uh muscle traction any use or any increase in uh and for the signs we look for um CO2 and also the level so based on this parameter, we specify them into the severity of current effect and we will manage them according to this algorithm. Um, the last one is pneumonia. So pneumonia is uh, uh, clinically divided into bronchial pneumonia and also lobal pneumonia. So this is bronchial pneumonia is um, a brightness with cough and they also have a special distress. Generalized on x ray, you can see there is generalized. Uh, for loba, it's similar, but it's just that on radio cut, there is uh, only um, a local population. So, for the etiology, mainly it's virus, especially in younger children. For example, respiratory virus, but for older children, uh, usually it's bacteria in origin. And this is uh, divided according to each. And for school going children, which really uh, common organisms are the ACG organism, for example, mycoplasma and also training them So for the clinical features, um, uh, as mentioned previously, we were living in cough and usually is to the priority eye. And it can also associate the issue type and also protein. So for the physical examination, um, there is respect to this uh, science as uh, follows. And on the SAT examination, um, there will be uh, dullness of the condition. There will be 
stop in exploitation, there will be decrease in restaurant and also born to be. But then, uh, not all patients uh, can present to eat this. But usually, there will be post cycles and post cycles, post cycles. And it's starting over the, uh, over the, so for the investigation, to be test x ray, especially when there is a uh, clinical features that is suggested of pneumonia. And then, uh, what cell count? Usually, the uh, neutrophils is inside, which is suggested by bacteria. And if there is leukopenia, it could be because uh, viral in origin or there is ovarian infection. And other than this, the uh, blood count, we can also do the blood count sensitivity. We know the pathogen uh, for the kit later on. Or if the patient had a uh, fluid effusion, you can also tap for any central sensitivity in this analysis. Uh, that's it. It's an uh, investigation you can do for such an So for the management, uh, antibiotics uh, in the protocol, this uh, depends on each pathogen. Uh, there are a few choices of antibiotics. And other than antibiotics, we can also give supportive treatment. We can give fluids to prevent dehydration, to correct any dehydration. Or if the patient is in pain, we can give anesthesia. And we also need to maintain the oxygen for more than 95%. And uh, we can also give uh, a system more to control the temperature to reduce the discomfort to the patient. And lastly, we can give chest medical to assist uh, the investigation. So that is my reference. Any questions? Okay, any questions? Yeah? Uh, and, uh, may I ask uh, the terms of uh, status as my uh, is it the same with the acute exacerbation of asthma because the terms are already being omitted from pitch protocol so I wonder if we're still using that term yeah, I'm not sure Is there anybody from the call can offer their answer Probably that the can respond to this question. I think it does. Hi guys, we're gonna have to Guys, okay. 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 Okay, because I'm using two screens actually. I'm using my phone and the PC as well. It's about my PC too a bit crazy, and right now my mic, my mouse also crazy. Okay, now my status asthmaticus actually is an old term lah. So usually nowadays we just say whether it's acute severe exacerbation of okay, asthma. Uh, uh, I mean, as long as you know what is severe and acute exacerbation, how to identify an acute severe exacerbation of bronchial asthma is more important than you memorizing the terminology. Okay, but as it is nowadays, we don't tend to say it is asthmatic, asthmaticus, uh, we tend to say uh, severe acute exacerbation. Okay? Okay, thank you, Dr. Uh, wait. I'm trying to share some videos, but my mouse has gone crazy. Uh, give me a second. Now, the thing about this is that it's very long. And then, um, because this topic is more of an approach. Okay? So it's more of during history, what do you look for? How do you differentiate stuff? So it's, it is more of like, like if you get a child with breathlessness, is it an acute thing or a 
uh, chronic thing. It's an acute thing, especially in the in the between the ages of the younger kids who are toddlers, like two to three years old. Kids that's one year old who still tend to put stuff into their mouth. So you're more worried about things like um, foreign body inhalation. Uh, if it's uh, a few days old kind of thing with, his, with a history of fever, then you're worried about any whether it's an infection thing. If it's an acute breathlessness on a background of intermittent episodes of breathlessness chronically, then you obviously think about uh, asthma, right? Uh, let's see. <laughs> Give me two minutes, I'm going to go and get a battery. Yeah. Uh, guys, uh, you guys uh, continue with your CVS first. My son's hamster has gone on the list. Guys? I'll continue with uh, Help me, uh. you guys continue with the CVS for a while because my son's hamster has gone missing. Hey, doctor. Okay? Okay, you guys continue first. Uh, just continue the CBS for one. Can you see my slide? Yes. Okay, so today I will, uh, my name is Avil Binti Burhanuddin. We will be presenting on child with cyanosis. So this are the outline of my presentation from introduction, types of cyanosis, the mechanism of cyanosis, uh, and then the etiology of cyanosis, the clinical approach, principle of management, and last but not least is the summary. Okay. For the cyanosis, so the, uh, let us define cyanosis. So cyanosis is bluish purple discoloration of the tissue due to increase in concentration of deoxygenated hemoglobin in the capillary bed. So here I provide uh, definition of hypoxia, hypoxemia, anemia, and polycythemia so that uh, it will not be confused. So hypoxia is low oxygen supply to tissue. Hypoxemia is low arterial oxygen content. Anemia is reduced in hemoglobin. Meanwhile, for polycythemia is the increase in hemoglobin concentration. Okay. The cyanosis can be detected when the level of deoxygenated hemoglobin is above 3 to 5. I didn't know that. 
this can be seen when the level of deoxygenated hemoglobin is above 3 to 5 gram per deciliter. And the intensity of the hemoglobin, it depends upon the amount of deoxygenated hemoglobin rather than uh, ratio to deoxygenated ratio of deoxygenated to deoxygenated to oxygenated hemoglobin. Okay, for the type of cyanosis, there are three types of cyanosis, central cyanosis, peripheral, and differential cyanosis. Okay, for central cyanosis, so, uh, Wait, why cyanosis, the lips so black? <laughs> Say hello everybody, sorry for disturbing the class. <laughs> hello. Hello. Yes. Guys, continue. Okay. Uh, for central cyanosis, it is a pathologic condition caused by reduced in arterial oxygen concentration. It so can be detected when the oxygen saturation is less than 85%. For peripheral uh, cyanosis, is, uh, there is normal uh, arterial oxygen saturation. Okay. Back to central cyanosis, the cardiac output is typically normal and has the patient has warm extremities. For the central cyanosis, it involves the skin, mucous membrane, and the tongue. Okay, for peripheral cyanosis, uh, it involves only the skin. And the cause of peripheral cyanosis is uh, due to uh, increase in tissue oxygen extraction. For example, when uh, in cold temperature, there will be vessel constriction of the blood, blood vessel, capillary blood vessel, and then uh, there will be stasis of uh, mislagish movement of the blood inside the capillary, and there will be more extraction of oxygen uh, at the peripheral. At the peripheral. Okay, then uh, the third one is differential uh, cyanosis. So differential cyanosis is defined as upper half body is pink and the lower half is cyanotic or vice, vice versa. So uh, in a condition with, uh, with vice versa, uh, it is called uh, it is called uh, reverse differential cyanosis. Okay. In differential cyanosis, usually patient with uh, in persistent pulmonary hypertension of newborn or severe coarctation and interrupted RTH. So differential cyanosis can be detected by uh, the pre and post ductal oxygenate, oxygenation test. Okay, then uh, factors that uh, affecting the cyanosis. So the first one is hemoglobin count. So in uh, in a polycythemic patient, we can detect the cyanosis at a higher level of uh, saturation of oxygen. Meanwhile, in a patient with uh, severely anemic, we uh, they may they may not have uh, we may not detect the cyanosis. A severe severely anemic patient. And the second one is uh, skin pigmentation. Uh, cyanosis less apparent in a darker skin. And the third one is other physiological factors. So. Uh, these factors are factors that affecting the oxygen dissociation curve for the left to uh, shift shift to the left meaning that uh, the oxygen is there is high affinity to oxygen so the cyanosis is detected at a low at a lower pao2 meanwhile uh, for the right shift uh, it is uh, the cyanosis is, is detectable at the higher pao2 for the mechanism of cyanosis, uh, first one is alveolar hypoventilation, second is diffusion uh, impairment, third is ventilation perfusion mismatch, fourth is, is the right to left shunting at the intracardiac great vessel or intrapulmonary level, and the last one is hemoglobinopathy. Okay, for etiology, the causes of cyanosis I divided into uh, non cardiac cause and cardiac cause. Okay, for non cardiac cause, you know. so this is uh, just a general rule for newborn and neonates, they tend to have uh, more cardiovascular cause, especially uh, cyanotic heart disease, it's more common than pulmonary. Meanwhile, in older children, they tend to have. They tend to have cyanosis due to pulmonary cause rather than cardiovascular cause. 
Okay, for non-cardiac cause, the first one, uh, according to the mechanism that I explained just now, uh, alveolar hyperventilation. Okay, uh, there are three. Uh, CNS depression, for example, like asphyxia, maternal sedation, intraventricular hemorrhage, seizure, meningitis, and ectitis. So in CNS uh, depression, they will uh, depress the respiratory center and cause uh, alveolar hyperventilation. Then in neuromuscular disease, such as in neonatal myasthenia gravis and phrenic nerve injury. So in phrenic nerve injury, they will cause weakness of the diaphragm, uh, diaphragm muscle and cause uh, hyperventilation. And the last but not least is airway obstruction, like coanal atresia. You can see uh, below uh, the uh, coanal atresia. So coanal atresia is uh, the congenital stenosis of the post nasal aperture, posterior nasal aperture. So here you can see a uh, uni unilateral atresia, coanal atresia, and this one is bilateral. So there is no communication between uh, posterior nasal cavity and also nasal pharynx. So the child tend to have uh, tend to breathe more to uh, orally instead of using the nose. Then uh, other than coenatresia, laryngeal malacia, macrogrossia, and Pierrobin syndrome also can cause uh, airway obstruction and can lead to sinusitis. So in the picture uh, at the lateral side, you can see the this is a Pierrobin syndrome patient. So Pierrobin syndrome is uh, classically described as a triad of uh, mandible hypoplasia. So you can see they have small mandible, or <clears throat> in medical term, is known as micrognathia. Then uh, they have the second triad uh, in the triad is glossoptosis. So glossoptosis is posterior displacement of the tongue. So this glossoptosis can cause uh, airway obstruction and can lead to sinusitis. And the third triad is the, uh, uh, can cause airway obstruction. And uh, in Pierrobin syndrome, uh, we can observe the U-shaped cleft palate. This is the uh, pathognomonic sign of the Pierrobin syndrome. Then for a second non-cardiac cause is uh, due to VQ mismatch. So in VQ mismatch, so uh, this cause is uh, usually can be seen in the newborn that I listed here. So uh, the first one is respiratory distress syndrome. So respiratory distress syndrome is defined as surfactant deficiency by type one, uh, type two pneumocyte. So it is, uh, it is uh, an exclusive. Uh, respiratory disease of a preterm baby. However, it can also occur in a, in an infant with a diabetic mother. So the function of the surfactant is to reduce the alveolar surface tension, thereby facilitate facilitate the alveolar expansion, and uh, thus reducing uh, the likelihood of alveolar collapse. So when there is a uh, surfactant deficiency, uh, the child will have more prone, more prone to alveolar collapse or lung collapse, known as uh, atelectasis. Okay. Then uh, meconium aspiration syndrome. So in meconium aspiration syndrome, uh, usually uh, it occurs due to intrauterine distress. <clears throat> Uh, that can cause the passage of meconium into the amniotic fluid. Uh, so, uh, it cause meconium aspiration. And the third one is Eric syndrome. So, Eric syndrome as, is defined as respiratory distress associated with pulmonary, interstitial emphysema, emphysema or pneumothorax or pneumopericardium or pneumoperitoneum or subcutaneous emphysema. So, Eric syndrome occurs uh, due to pregial and immature lung cause, cause the alveoli to be, to be burst and there will be accumulation of air outside the lung. So, accumulation of air outside the lung, you can see uh, in pneumothorax, pneumopericardium, neuro pneumoperitoneum and subcutaneous emphysema. Okay, the first one is transient tachypnea of newborn. 
it is the most common respiratory distress uh, in newborn due to a uh, delay in resorption of lung liquid, especially uh, in an in infant that is born via cesarean section. So, for instance, the kidney of newborn it, uh, usually occurs in a uh, infant with seizure uh, because uh, uh, in a in a normal de delivery in SVD, there will be compression of the chest when the uh, when the child is born. Meanwhile, in seizure, there is no compression of the chest to remove the lung lung fluid. Okay, the fifth one is neonatal pneumonia. Neonatal pneumonia, we have uh, early onset and late onset. The early onset usually caused by uh, infection getting get got from the mother. They got from the mother during uh, intrauterine. Uh, for example, when the mother has GBS, then uh, you can transmit the the GBS to the to the to the fetus. The late onset usually due to nosocomial cause. The neonatal pneumonia can progress to sepsis, and then can cause cyanosis. So sepsis, uh, in sepsis, the uh, vessel constriction of the blood vessels, so uh, can cause the stasis of the blood and can cause cyanosis. Then uh, congenital abnormalities of lung and diaphragm, <clears throat> like uh, congenital diaphragmatic hernia and congenital cystic adenomat adenomatoid uh, malformation. So in CDH, uh, congenital diaphragmatic hernia, they can uh, impair the development of the lung in utero. Uh, so it also can cause uh, respiratory distress. Respiratory distress. Okay, congenital cystic uh, adenomatic malformation uh, is the for that uh, the overgrowth of the abnormal lung tissue. So the abnormal lung tissue has a fluid filled cyst. So uh, the abnormal tissue uh, has impact in uh, ventilation function. So it can it can transfer the oxygen uh, to uh, to the pulmonary solution. Okay. For the third nine cardiac cause is hemoglobinopathy. So hemo uh, there is a met hemoglobinemia. So met hemoglobinemia uh, is can be cause uh, the cause of met hemoglobinemia can be congenital and secondary to toxic exposure. So for congenital, uh, the meaning of met hemoglobinemia is that the iron inside the hemoglobin uh, is not in a, in a normal form, which is uh, normal form is ferrous. So in met hemoglobinemia, there is a ferric state of iron form, ferric. Ferrum three plus. So uh, this abnormal hemoglobin uh, results in a decreased availability of the oxygen to the tissue, meaning they tend to uh, to bind to the oxygen uh, stronger than a normal hem hemoglobin. So it can also cause, uh, it can also due to secondary toxic exposure, such as uh, due to met hemoglobin inducing substance, substance such as uh, in nitrates, in nitrates, uh, exposure to the nitrates. Then uh, the fourth one is diffuse in impairment like uh, pulmonary edema pulmonary fibrosis and congenital lymphangiectasia. Okay. So nine cardiac cause in older children is uh, quite a different from the newborn or neonate. So here I listed uh, decrease in inspired oxygen. So we can uh, ask the patient any exposure to the burn house, so uh, or fire. Carbon, so exposure to carbon monoxide, cyanide, and uh, asphyxiating gas can cause cyanosis. Then upper airway obstruction, like uh, for foreign body group, epiglottitis, and congenital airway anomalies. So uh, below, you can see uh, the X-ray of the ray in a uh, group, group patient. So there is special sign uh, called uh, steeple sign. 
can be seen in food. Then uh, the third one is epiglottitis. So we can see uh, tripod position is uh, we can observe in epiglottitis. Okay, for uh, impact chest wall or lung expansion due to the restricted uh, lung to be uh, from they uh, tend to have uh, less expansion due to new motorax, motorax and clear chest. And the fourth one is parenchymal lung disease like asthma, bronchiolitis, pneumonia. Then for cardiac cause, so for cardiac cause, uh, we know that uh, the congenital, uh, congenital, uh, congenital, genetic congenital heart disease is uh, can cause the diagnosis. Okay. So for cyanotic congenital heart disease can be divided into decrease in pulmonary blood flow and increase in pulmonary blood flow. Okay, for decrease in pulmonary blood flow, like in pathology of pellet, most common, uh, the most common is cyanotic heart disease. So in pathology of pellet, they have uh, four characteristics. The first one is, uh, is the pulmonary stenosis. Second is uh, VSD. The third one is overriding of aorta, and the fourth one is right ventricular hypertrophy. So there will be mixing of the blood. So from the right to the left. Then uh, tricuspid valve anomalies, uh, such as in tricuspid atresia, pulmonary atresia with VSD. Uh, and uh, last one is critical valvular pulmonary stenosis. So in critical valvular pulmonary stenosis, uh, it's a severe form of the pulmonary stenosis. Then uh, <clears throat> in uh, increase in cyanotic heart disease that has uh, increased in pulmonary blood flow, examples are transposition of great artery, uh, which is ductal dependent, meaning that they, they, they depend on the duct to maintain the systemic circulation, the truncus and uh, then truncus arteriosus is a form of complex cyanotic uh, heart disease. Then uh, total anomalous pulmonary venous return. You can see the picture here. The, the first picture is a transposition of the great artery. So you can see uh, they have a two parallel <coughs> circulation. Okay, parallel circulation. The this one is uh pulmonary circulation, but it's connected to aorta. And the, for the left sided, it's connected to the pulmonary, and they have a uh, separate circulation. Okay, so the blood that uh goes to the systemic is the deoxygenated blood from the aorta. So this uh we can see the sinusis. And then uh, the picture at the uh, at the at the side, you can see this is a TAPVR, a uh, total anomalous pulmonary venous return. So in total anomalous uh, pulmonary venous return is associated with a total mixing of a systemic venous and pulmonary venous blood within the heart. So when there is a total mixing. Uh, so we just producing cyanosis. Okay. So there are two uh, two major clinical present pattern of the APVR. Uh, it depends on the presence or absence of the obstruction. So in patient with having the APVR with a uh, severe obstruction tend to have cyanosis and uh, severe cyanosis and respiratory disease. Okay, so management of the PVR is emergency surgical correction. And then um, FSM Menger syndrome. So FSM Menger syndrome, uh, it is uh, reverse shunting from so initially, like in uh, large VSD, they have left to uh, right shunting. But uh, eventually, uh, they, they, when there is, uh, there will be a reverse shunting and cause FSM Menger syndrome. Then uh, for severe uh, heart failure, uh, it can be due to hypoplastic left heart syndrome, coarctation of aorta, 
So in quotation of a reptile that, that cause cyanosis is a predactyl. You can see here, uh, predactyl, uh, predactyl quotation of a reptile. And in this predactyl type, or known as neuropental type, it depends on the uh, the, the ductus atlusus. Uh, so that the pulmonary trunk, so that the pulmonary, uh, the blood from the pulmonary, uh, pulmonary side, you go to the systemic. Mm. Then the third one is interrupted aortic arch. Mm. Okay, so here are the mnemonic for genetic heart disease. So uh, known as 5T, position PGA, TOF, truncus atlusus, TAPVR, and truncus feet. This uh, Atresia or atresia per abnormality. And for the 60 is uh, added due uh, for ton of disease. Like double outlet right ventricle, pulmonary atresia, many more. Okay. For uh, differential sinusis, as, as I described earlier, there will be sinusis at the lower extremities. Meanwhile, uh, pink on the upper extremities. So we can see uh, this condition, the differential sinusis in a PDA with reversal, reversal shine. For example, like in PPHN, severe coarctation and interrupted aortic arch. Okay. For reverse differential sinusis, the reverse, reverse color, meaning that the upper, the upper extremities tend to have sinusis. Meanwhile, the lower, lower extremities is pink. So it's seen in TGA with either partition of aorta or pulmonary hypertension. Okay, so this uh, this listed from the Nelson, the differential diagnosis of neonatal sinusis. So they divide according to the system, like pulmonary, cardiovascular, central nervous system, hematologic, and metabolic. Okay, for clinical approach, so our aim is to differentiate uh, physiologic from pathologic sinusis. So, uh, physiologic sinusis uh, is like uh, this one, acrosinusis. Usually, uh, does not indicate pathology and occurs soon after birth uh, that resulted from the vest motor changes. The second aim is to uh, differentiate cardiac from non cardiac cause, and the third one is to find the cause which needs urgent treatment or referral. Okay. So for a uh, clinical approach, starting with the three and uh, do the physical examination, investigation, and management. Okay. For a uh, history of presenting illness, so we have to see the onset of the sinusis. So for the, for the onset of sinusitis heart disease, it really depends on the nature, meaning what, what is the uh, type of the sinusitis heart disease that the patient has and the severity of the of the sinusitis CHD. Then, uh, second is alteration in cardiovascular physiology like closure of ductus atlusus and fall in pulmonary vascular resistance. If, for example, like uh, in tetralogy of Hazel, uh, which is the most common, uh, most common types of sinusitis congenital heart disease. So, uh, the severe, usually uh, the sinusitis, the onset of sinusitis uh, is above four months old. However, if the patient has a more severe form of pulmonary stenosis, so they tend to have an early onset of stenosis. Early onset of stenosis uh, in cardiac lesion. Then uh, associated symptoms, you can ask about fever. Fever suggesting the infectious cause for sepsis. Then uh, any trauma, impairment of the chest wall, for body, upper airway obstruction, uh, like uh, when they have respiratory stridor during a saliva, any hoarseness of voice, that suggesting epiglottitis. Then exposure to the any uh, harm, harm partic harmful particle, smoke inhalation can cause carbon monoxide poisoning, and exposure to any lindai, nitrobenzene. Nitrates and nitrates. So this nitrates uh, derived substance can cause uh, methemoglobinemia. 
then uh, birth history, birth history, must ask about antenatal history, uh, GDM, the GD, uh, gestational diabetes mellitus in mother can, can uh, is a risk factor for transient acute of newborn, uh, respiratory distress syndrome, hypoglycemia, and PGA, transposition of gray artery. Then uh, oligohydramnia, uh, oligohydramnia uh, can cause pulmonary hypoplasia. And C induced hypertension can cause also can cause pulmonary hypoplasia. Okay, for advanced maternal age, uh, as we know that uh, the child is going to have high risk of having uh, Down syndrome. That's so only 21. Okay, drug and drug intake, like lithium, can cause Epstein anomaly. For perinatal history, we ask about the any any uh, leaking lyco, testing uh, RM. For, okay, then we have to ask about the smell of the lyco, or for smelling lyco and uh, maternal pyrexia, GBS and GBS positive during perinatal can suggest the neonatal sepsis or pneumonia. Then uh, history of uh, even sedative or anesthetic can cause respiratory distress or apnea. Cesarean section uh, is a risk factor for transient acute of newborn and pulmonary persistent pulmonary hypertension. Then, uh, preterm infant are more prone to RDS, post maturity, while gestational age and fetal distress can uh, has a risk for meconium aspiration syndrome. Then postnatal, we have to ask about uh, the, the sinuses decrease during crying or confirm. Uh, so these two, these two points suggesting the coenia atresia. Because, uh, why the sinuses decrease during crying? Because uh, when crying, they will open their mouth and uh, breathe to the mouth instead of breathing uh, via the nasal. Then past medical history ask about uh, if older children ask about prior lung disease uh, such as pre-existing asthma and condition like bronchopulmonary dyspepsia and ask about also congenital heart disease like synthetic heart disease. For example, like in uh, tetralogy of fellow, they can present with a uh, emergency condition called hypersynotic spell. Then uh, in family history, can ask about atopy uh, and eczema or allergic rhinitis can suggest uh, bronchi asthma. Okay, for the physical examination, first we have to determine whether the patient has central sinusis or peripheral sinusis. Then we must not be uh, confused with this uh, sign like Mongolian spot. So it's not a sinusis. The blue tattoo and a uh, Blue dye. Okay. And then for general examination, we must also look for syndromic phases like uh, in trisomy 21, uh, 18 or 13. And uh, other syndromic phases like uh, Turner or the Josh syndrome. And plus other syndromic phases also we can see in pyrobin that tend to have airway obstruction. Okay, then uh, look for any anemia, sinusis, or any polycythemia. Then look for hydration status to suggest so if the patient has uh, sepsis, uh, might have a uh, cold clammy hand. Okay. Okay. Then for vital sign, uh, first is for the temperature. So in uh, newborn or neonate, they tend to have temperature instability uh, if they have any infection. Like uh, in neonatal sepsis, they have they can have hypo or hypothermia. Uh, then tachycardia and uh, palpate for the pulse. The so weak pulse uh, can suggest hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Then uh, if we can also took the blood pressure at the at uh, four limbs, all of the four limbs, then we can compare the blood pressure. 
the blood pressure is higher in the upper extremities in uh, rather than in lower extremities, it suggests partition of the tough. Then, then for respiratory examination, so in respiratory examination, we look for sign of respiratory distress like the kidney, bearing, grunting, and subcostal recession. So uh, this is to this is to uh, rule out the respiratory cause. And then uh, you can uh, hear the stridor. So you can look for any suprasternal retraction that suggests upper airway obstruction. And uh, we can hear uh, the rails or crackles, any asymmetric breath sound, wheezing, or lower, uh, suggesting lower airway disease like pneumonia or pulmonary edema. Okay, for clear lungs, uh, we can, if the lung is clear, we can think uh, about the cardiovascular cause of sinusitis, like in uh, sinusitic congenital heart disease. Then uh, look for abnormal chest wall movement, like in clear chest. Then inspect is there any wound or abrasion, and is there any subcutaneous air with crepitus that can suggesting uh, trauma to the chest wall. Okay, for cardiovascular examination. As usual, uh, inspect, palpit, um, uh, palpit and ascultate. So these are uh, among several findings. In uh, tetralogy of failure, we can find a uh, finger clubbing. Finger clubbing and the murmur, the type of murmur is uh, ejection systolic murmur uh, due to pulmonary stenosis. Then uh, transposition of red arteries. You can hear uh, the loud S2, loud second heart sound, loud and single second heart sound. Usually there is no murmur, but uh, they may have a solid murmur due to increase in pulmonary blood flow. Okay. Then uh, abdominal examination, uh, we can just observe is to see is there any scaphoid abdomen to suggest congenital deformity hernia. Congenital deformity hernia can cause uh, uh, abnormal that reduce in development of the lung during in utero and cause uh, due to under development of the lung can cause respiratory distress and can cause uh, sinusitis. Then for sinus examination, look for apnea uh, apnea irregular expression yellow breathing. There, there. Yes. How many more slides do you have? How many slides? Uh, altogether about 50 slides. Currently at uh, 37 slides. Eh? The one that you sent me very much shorter, right? Oh, <laughs> I did <laughs> time yesterday. Okay, now the, the, the problem is that so you just keep your, keep your slides there. The, the thing about all these clinical approaches kind of topics is that they basically want to know whether you guys know how to approach us from a sim symptom point of view. Now, if you're talking about sinusitis, the most important thing is whether to differentiate whether it's a cardiovascular thing or non-cardiovascular thing most of the time, isn't it? The two main things would be a cardiovascular cause or a respiratory cause for the sinusitis, right? Then you've got things like others, you've got... Uh, uh, you've got things uh, which causes peripheral sinusitis. So the first thing you do is you need to decide whether it's a central sinusitis thing or a peripheral sinusitis thing. Then for work presentation wise, based on history, you go by uh, there you go back to your history part. Mm -hmm. So uh, one more, but, 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 okay. So on set, the first thing is, but then you decide whether the child has been sinus since birth, yeah. or the child is has a pre-existing condition which may predispose to sinusitis and is now currently more sinus, or was previously a little bit sinus and is now progressively the sinusitis has, has worsened. So kids who have uh, pulmonary hypertension those who have uh, sinusitis heart disease, isn't it? And then yes. uh. After that, uh, or whether this kid has been totally well and has now have suddenly turned blue. If it's an acute thing, well, 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 suddenly turned blue, maybe it's something like 
a problem body inhalation, right? Or uh, sometimes it's uh, uh, chemical inhalation, this kind of super side effects. If the child has been unwell for a while, a fever, what seems to have to be a lower tummy tract infection type of symptoms for a few days and now has turned sinus, then you know that the sinusitis is most probably likely due to a very severe lower respiratory tract infection, whether it's acute bacterial like or pneumonia. Uh, change the slide. If it's not clear, you guys just angkat tangan ke or put a message somewhere if any of you still awake. Uh. Uh, change the slide, Abe. Super slide. Okay, wait, wait, wait. One by one slowly. Slowly. Right, yes. Okay, so that's basically it. Change. Antenatal history. So these are more of the causes of sinusitis that you find in neonates, isn't it? Right? Yes. So next. So these are the history that you take with somebody who was previously not sinus and is now kind of sinus. Lah. Go. Next. So central sinusis, you look at the mucous membrane, so basically the tongue. Mongolian blue spots, um, I doubt you would mistake it for sinusis. You are more likely to mistake it in cases of non-accidental injury, you would think it's... Uh, bruise rather than sinusis because you don't get sinusis that touchy over the back of the extensor surfaces. Tattoos, fair enough. Discoloration, fair enough. Okay, fine. Next. Hypothermia. Okay, next. So once again, most of your symptoms will be um will be most of the time towards your most of the time found in your respiratory examination but it doesn't actually differentiate whether it's a respiratory cause or, or a cardiac cause until you complete your examination to include the cardiac uh, examination next 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 okay wait 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 so i mean this scaphoid abdomen thing you if, if you're looking for sinusis, you will see this during after right in the immediate postpartum period, isn't it? The first first within a few hours, or if it's a small diaphragmatic hernia, then maybe you can miss it for the first few days, lah. Next. Okay, don't forget that you can also be sinus because uh the child is not breathing well, lah. So whether the child is apneic or hypo hypo Next. Yeah. Next. Okay. Uh, not practical, but done theoretically, but like I said, not practical. Lah. Next. Uh, Abi, I think yes. Abi. This one. For uh, uh, so uh, pre we can uh, do pre ductal and post ductal oxygen saturation. So the aim is to detect the differential sinusis. Okay, uh, so uh, there are so pre ductal we check. So we can either use pulse oximetry or ABG. So pulse oximetry uh, measures SpO2. In my ABG, we, we look at the result of PaO2 or SaO2. Okay, for uh, pre ductal we, we measure at the right hand. And for post ductal we measure at the right or left foot. But usually, we took at the right, uh, right, right foot. Okay, for uh, a normal patient should have a pre and post ductal has the same value of uh, about the same uh, value of the SpO2, SpO2 and SaO2. And well, for uh, patient who has differential saturation or differential sinusis, meaning that uh, the predictor PaO2 is uh, 10 to 15 millimeter mercury more than postductor PaO2. Or uh, they have. 
you know, from a practical point of view, if you have a baby who's unknown and you want to know whether it's a not really a so like your situation or whatever. Anyway, if pre doctor will be your right hand, right? Yes. Post doctor will be everything else. Yeah, anything. So if your pre doctor is higher than your post doctor, most likely it's a cardio 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 cardiac cause because the oxygenated blood goes here. The non or the, the ones where there's mixing because of the PPA goes to the post doctor area. So basically that's it lah. Okay, if it's not a cardiac cause, then it doesn't matter whether it's pre-doctor or post-doctor. Okay, so next, are they next? Yes, mm -hmm. So, investigations. Mm, fine. So FBC, whether if the white blood cell is high, you think it's more likely an infection. If the hemoglobin is high, the polycythemia and all those things, you would, you would already have known it's a cyanotic heart disease, wouldn't, wouldn't you? ABG septic workout for the causes and also for the sepsis. ECG fine, echo fine, chest x-ray fine. Next, Abhi. Yes. Uh, X-ray. Good shape heart, right? Then you're supposed to see ridges on the on the ribs, which is not very clear here. Next. Snowman appearance. Why? Because there is congestion. Okay. Next. Hmm. Take on the string. Next. Next. Okay. I don't think you guys need to do this. This you are just basically doing the causes, right? Next, please. Emergency condition. Um, okay, this is for kids. Uh, okay, we see your F, okay. Next. Next. Now, this, this you need to know. As a medical student, you need to know that. You don't need to be, it doesn't need to be presented here. Just make sure you get the slides and then you read up on it, okay? Next. Yeah. Okay, I think that's it. Um, anything you guys want to ask? Or if you've got anything to ask, then just speak up or you just type a message. Now, I actually wanted to show... Is everybody still awake? Ah? Angkat tangan. I actually wanted to show you guys some videos. But, 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 um, I think that's that the master because I actually need to go and fetch my kid. Um, yeah. um, You guys can see the playlist there, right? Yes. Okay, yeah. I cannot show all. Tell me what you want to see. Because I can only tahan for another five minutes, I need to go. Um, now. When a child is brought to you with cough, the child breathes out. Right, if you listen to it, it's all expire three. This 
it is if it is fried oil, then it's an inspiratory sound. So it'll be this. Nah, he don't. <laughs> Let's see what we got. Yeah, you can hear or not because you were shaking your head. Uh, I can hear it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Inspiratory, so try that be right? Reason will be expiratory. Unless you ask the doctor for deal lah, but that's a different thing lah because it's the common of this. But for all intents and purposes, if you're a medical student, all ex all wrong kind should be expiratory. Uh, fried should be inspiratory. Okay. If Dr. Fadil asks you whether it can be expiratory and inspiratory, not the answer is actually yes. But for medical students, for when people ask you whether wrong kind is inspiratory or expiratory, your answer should be expiratory. Okay. Fried is always inspiratory. Um, since Monday, the coughing has been worse, and she coughs sometimes so hard she throws up more than spitting up, but everything, okay. but not every time. She Dr. Paul here. We've got a two-month-old. We missed you. And uh, when I saw them a couple days ago, I'm thinking, well, it was per minute. We do have a pulse oximeter. We checked it. It was 98 on room air last time, two days ago, 98. Cough. That's a bronchiolitis cough. And that's probably RSV. We didn't check last time, did we? So I think we should do that. We should just go ahead and make sure we know exactly what we're dealing with. So we're gonna do a little nose swab, if that's okay with folks, yep. Okay. We'll hold her head up so it stays. That way I'll have better I'll switch hands. Okay, sure. Okay, all right, you hold her head nice and still for me. Oh. Okay, we're just gonna go up there. Oh, with that booger. There we go. Slurp. Plop, 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 plop. There we go, folks. The thing about our upper lobe is crackly. Right upper lobe, the patient's right, left, right lower, left. And it's just very crackly up there, but good news is the rest of the lungs are clear. What does crackly so, mean? Well, when you get fluid... Anyway, um, you can see the effort of the kid, right? The head bobbing up and out a bit. Like, probably if you look lift, lifted up the car from the front, then you could probably see the inspiration and the, experience, the respiratory muscles to be used. Um, it should be that one. Um, I really, I really need to go. But uh, fifth years gun, long time already, never go to the what gun, true. So if you, in between streaming your music videos, you, you can just basically search this up and just see how they do it, okay? Okay. That um, so I can push it down. Okay, so you might be easier to push it down rather than. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Okay, sweetheart. Yeah. You are very active. Am I allowed to know how old Adam is? Dad, how old is Adam? Uh, he's. Okay. Uh, if you have time, then you just need a revision. You just go to this site. Okay, and you search for the examination technique because it's for um, postgraduate. La, so some of the things they, they do, you might not understand, but more by and large, it's the correct way of doing it. So they have uh, neurological CVS, they have the whole range of it. La. So just to refresh yourself, just go and take a look. 
Okay, and then most of the time they use station so you can see uh, the flow of it. Lah. Okay. And I really need to go right now. So can we just end the class? Okay, doctor. Okay, doctor. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor. Yeah, push back the push back the thing to eleven o'clock.